Welcome to Arcadia. In my last video, I explained some of the basic concepts for combat in D&D, but I talked for a really long time and sometimes people just really need a visual example. So let's do that. If you didn't see my previous video, I highly encourage you to do so just to make sure that you understand all the game terms that I will be talking about in here, since I may not be re-explaining them all. Look for the video in the eye up there or down below in the Underdark. That being said, I'm not your boss, so do whatever you want. To help us out in here, let's use two characters of mine, Gorik the Dwarven Cleric and Eldar the Half-Elf Rogue. Let's imagine these two adventurers are exploring an ancient crypt. When they see a lot of bones and skulls scattered through the fort, they start levitating and reassembling into skeletons that attack them. This is now a combat. So let's bring the miniatures. First things first, let's roll initiative to determine the battle order. Gorik's player rolls a 16 on the dice, but we need to have his dexterity modifier to have the total initiative number. Gorik has a minus one dexterity modifier, so his initiative is 15. 16 minus one. Eldar does the same, he rolls a 10, but his plus three dexterity modifier raises his initiative to 13. Then, the DM rolls the skeleton's initiative behind a DM screen and announces that the skeletons rolled 11 on their initiative. So we have Gorik going first with 15, then Eldar with 13, and finally the skeletons with 11. On his turn, Gorik has a movement, an action, and, if applicable, a bonus action. He decides to start by moving towards one of the skeletons. If you look into Gorik's character sheet, right here, you will see that his speed is 25 feet. In the grid, every square has 5 feet by 5 feet, so a movement of 25 feet basically means 5 squares. Gorik actually only needs 20 feet, meaning 4 squares to get to the skeleton, but that's fine, you don't have to spend all your movement in a single go. Then, for his action, Gorik decides to attack. This means that he will use a weapon, in his case a warhammer, to try and hit the opponent. To see if he actually hits, he rolls to attack. This means rolling a d20 and then adding his strength, ability, modifier and also his proficiency bonus, because Gorik is proficient with warhammers. And by the way, if you're wondering uh, how can you know which weapons your character is proficient with, relax, that is all taken care of in character creation. Gorik rolls an 8, his strength modifier is plus 2 and his proficiency bonus is plus 2 as well, so he rolls a total of 12. That means that Gorik's player only needs to announce the DM, I rolled a 12 to attack. You only need a total number. The DM must then check the AC of the skeleton to see if Gorik hit. Normally the DM just answers if the attack hits or not. But just so you see what happens and why it happens that way, let's pull the curtain a bit. This is the skeleton stat block. It's a condensed block of information that tells the DM all they need to know about how to run that monster. And this is the skeleton's armor class, or AC. To hit, Gorik must roll equal or higher than the target's AC. Gorik also has an AC determined by the armor he wears, and if the monsters try to attack him, then that's the number that they will try to beat. In this case, Gorik rolled a 12 to attack, but the skeleton's AC is 13, which means that Gorik's attack doesn't land. The DM doesn't tell the players what the AC is, or at least, they don't need to. What they do, though, is describe narratively how Gorik swings his warhammer towards the skeleton, but the skeleton jumps back, avoiding it. With this, Gorik doesn't have anything else to do, and his turn ends. Now it's Eldar's turn. He uses his action to shoot an arrow from his short bow at the other skeleton. He rolls a 15, but since he is using a ranged weapon instead of a melee one, he doesn't add his strength modifier, he adds his dexterity one which is plus 3. Since he is proficient with the bow, he also has plus 2 from the proficiency bonus, so it is a total roll of 20. 20 to hit beats the skeleton's AC of 13, so the attack actually lands. Now Eldar needs to know how much damage he did to the skeleton, and he rolls for damage. According to the player's handbook, a short bow deals 1d6 of damage plus your dexterity modifier. Eldar rolls a 4 on the dice, plus 3 from his modifier equals a total of 7, so this means that the skeleton suffers 7 points of piercing damage. 
Now finally, it's the skeleton's turn. And since they are monsters, the DM runs everything they do. This means that you don't need to worry about this part, just answer the DM's questions and do what they tell you to do. They will normally tell you what the total number of the monsters roll to hit, uh, with no math ever being explained, but again, let's pull back the curtain a little bit. The DM decides that the skeletons will both use their movement to close the distance and attack Gorik, because he's closer. So the DM rolls to attack for both skeletons, and then have the bonus specified in the stat block, just like you do with your own bonuses. The first rolled a total of 6, and the second rolls a total of 16. So the DM asks Gorik what his AC is, to which Gorik's player responds, it's 15. This means that the first skeleton missed, but the second one hit, so the DM rolls damage behind the screen, which ends up being a total of 7, and describes how one of the skeletons lunges forward with his rusty sword in one hand, but Gorik bravely deflects the attack. However, he is unable to avoid the second attack suffering 7 points of slashing damage. So Gorik's player reduces his HP by 7. He had a total of 11, but now he is down to 4. If he loses all HP, he will go unconscious and maybe even die. But with this, everyone had a turn, which means that the first round of combat has passed. Nothing too complicated until now, right? Each individual had a movement and an action, which they used to attack. First they rolled to see if they hit, and only then they rolled how badly the enemy was injured. Now a new round begins with us going back to the first one on the initiative order, Gorik. Gorik decides that he can't risk being hit like that again, so he uses his movement to retreat. However, he is adjacent to two enemies, and he knows that when he leaves their vicinity, they will get attacks of opportunity as he's trying to escape. So, he uses his action to disengage, and only afterwards he moves away. That way, he won't provoke any attacks. Now, Gorik has already used his action for the turn, disengaging, but he has a spell prepared called Healing Word, which has a casting time of one bonus action. This means that he can use his bonus action, the one that you can only use if you have a feature that allows you to use it, to cast Healing Word, even though he already used his regular action on this turn. And so he casts the spell, which, according to the spell description, heals 1d4 plus the Wisdom modifier of the caster. He rolls a 1, bad luck, plus 2, which means he regains 3 hit points. Now it's Eldar's turn again, and he shoots another arrow. He rolls to attack, and it is a natural 20, a critical hit. This means that not only the attack will automatically hit, but also you roll twice the dice to determine the damage. Normally a shortbow would deal 1d6 damage, plus the dexterity modifier, but since this was a critical hit, Eldar instead rolls 2d6 plus 3 for his dexterity modifier. The total ends up being 9 points of piercing damage, and the DM, who has been keeping track of the skeleton HP, declares that Eldar's strike kills the skeleton. One enemy down. However, now it's the skeleton's turn again, and the remaining monster identifies Eldar as a threat. It moves towards him and attacks. The DM rolls a total of 13, which happens to be exactly Eldar's AC. This means that the skeleton's attack barely hits, so Eldar still suffers damage. The DM rolls a total of 8 points of damage, which means that Eldar is down from 9 HP to just 1. So the second round has passed, and now we have Eldar badly injured and one monster still up. We begin the third round of combat with Gorik again. This time, he decides to use his action to cast a spell, and he chooses to cast Sacred Flame. As explained in the spell's description, which you can find in the player's handbook or in the player's basic rules free PDF, when you cast Sacred Flame, you don't really roll to attack. Instead, the target rolls a saving throw, which, uh, in the case of this spell, is a dexterity saving throw, to see if they can escape the effect of your spell. And if they roll below the DC or difficulty class of the spell, they don't evade it and are hit. So the DM makes a saving throw. He rolls a total of 4 and tells this to Gorik's player. Now, when Gorik's player created his character, he had to calculate the DC for this spell. That's explained in the book in the character creation part, so uh, there is no need for us to discuss that, but if you want to learn more about this, I can recommend you to my video on character creation. Uh, look for it also in the eye up there or down below in the Underdark. For now, you can just believe me when I tell you that 
Gorik's DC is 12, as calculated during character creation, which means that the skeleton rolled below it. It fails. As such, the skeleton suffers 1d8 points of radiant damage, like the spell description tells us. And Gorik rolls 7 on the damage roll. Now it's Eldar's turn, and he's rather desperate. He only has 1 HP left, and if he fails this attack, he might die. So he decides to think outside the box. Eldar's player turns to the DM and says, um, I, want, I, want to, I want to try to intimidate the skeleton so he doesn't attack me. Can I shout something like, um, run away while you can, or you will face a fate worse than death. I will burn your bones so you may never again inhabit anything, and you are permanently killed, as you should have been in the first time. There is no action in D&D for what Eldar is trying to do, but it's perfectly possible to do something like this in actual games. Uh, you, if you have an idea that doesn't fit uh, what the game is prepared to handle, or doesn't seem covered by what the rules say, you can announce your intentions to the DM and let them make the ruling on the fly for you, and tell you what you should do. It could happen that the DM just says, I don't think that's really possible, or that's not within your character's possibilities, but there's always the chance that he might go with it. And after considering for a few seconds, the DM asks Eldar's player for an intimidation check. And he decides that uh, the skeleton will also roll. He will roll an insight check to contest Eldar's intimidation. This means that if Eldar rolls higher than what the skeleton will roll in insight, he will have his way. So Eldar rolls 10. And since the intimidation skill uses charisma, like it says on the character sheet, he has his charisma modifier of plus 2. But since Eldar also happens to be proficient in intimidation, he also has his proficiency bonus, which is plus 2. His total roll is 14, and the skeleton happens to roll 7. Eldar wins the contest. Now the DM improvises the solution, and ends up telling how the skeleton seems to have been afflicted by an unnatural fear, and it seems ready to run. And since now it's the skeleton turn, the DM can just say, well, the skeleton tries to run away because he was really, really scared about what you said. Uh, but he's so focused on running away that it doesn't disengage. This means that as soon as a skeleton abandons Eldar's surrounding space, Eldar is going to use his reaction to attempt an attack. He quickly pulls a dagger from his belt and rolls to attack. The dagger is being used as a melee weapon, which is, normally means that you would use your strength modifier, but as you can see in the book, the dagger is considered a finesse weapon. And finesse weapons are a little bit special because it means that you can use your dexterity modifier with them instead of your strength, just as if it was another ranged attack. Eldar rolls an 8, his modifiers sum up to plus 5, so Eldar rolls a total of 13 to attack. He just hits. The dagger damage is 1d4, in which Eldar rolls a 3, summed up with the dexterity modifier that gives a total of 6 points of piercing damage. And just like that, the DM says that Eldar reduced the skeleton's HP to 0. The skeleton dies! The DM may describe how Eldar lunges forward, dagger in hand, making use of the sudden disorientation that the skeleton had to strike him down, or may even invite Eldar's players to describe how he kills the monster. Whatever you say, it will become intertwined with the story in a way that only D&D can really pull off. And the battle is over, just like that. This was a very simple example of a D&D battle, just for you to get a feel of what you can do, what you need to do, what are attack and damage rolls, actions versus bonus actions and reactions, etc. Obviously, I can't talk about every single peculiarity that may happen in a D&D combat, otherwise we'd be here forever. So I'm sorry if I didn't touch on the topic that you wanted to know more about, but as with the previous video, I promise that I will try to go through all comments to assure that I answer all the questions that you might have. So shoot your questions down below in the Underdark. Even so, I hope that this gave you a more realistic perspective on how battles take place in D&D. Maybe we'll do a video about advanced combat rules in the future, who knows, but for now, I think we have been using a certain word a lot that many people may be wondering what it is and how it is calculated, which is proficiency. So let's talk about that next. For now though, thank you so much for watching. I hope I helped you to better understand how combat works. If you like this video, go check the rest of them. Every new view is another bit of XP I can use to level up in this crazy environment called YouTube. 
follow me on social media too, at tfirstarcadian on Twitter and at thefirstarcadian on basically anywhere else. For now, I bid you farewell, and I hope to see you in the next video.